Tech Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Um, so where's Amanda? That was a great uh, presentation. And when I first agreed to do this, Jen said, uh, we're not using PowerPoint. And I was like, what the? And then I was open to the serendipity, and it actually promoted some creativity. So I've prepared a, a special cartoon for you tonight, because what I uh, need to talk about has some visuals. And um, there, I am a professor. Uh, there will be no quiz at the end of this, but I am going to assign you some homework. And I want to hear back from you when, when you discover some things that we're going to talk about tonight. But I am going to ask my assistant, where's Steve? There you are. If you would uh, pass these out. I only made 50, so you're going to have to share. This is a collaborative community. They're double-sided, so um, couples can share. It works out very nicely. So I don't know about you, but when, um, when I was raising Molly, one of my favorite television programs was Calis 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 Cal Clarissa Explains It All. Remember that show? I love that show. It was a precocious 13-year-old kid who you know, got, got obsessed with some question or something in the world, and she'd drill right into it. And she would explain it to her viewers, and she you know, jotted some things down on the screen. Um, so I, I, I kind of like that model, and when I find things that I'm interested in, I ask a lot of questions and I begin to drill in and try to figure out, you know, w what's the world here? But the nice thing that Clarissa did is she put her own little wacky twist on it, so that's kind of what I do too. But the questions I have, and you're, are you timing me? Because I knew we'll go, but okay, um, is why do we do what we do online, and who the heck is in control of all this stuff? So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to explore a little bit of modern and postmodern experience models for you because the model of experience, the model of reality is changing as we speak. Um, I'm going to look at some historical perspectives of self and for people, I know I got a couple of psych majors in the room, uh, but if you took your psych 101 and you know in, in, at college you'll, re, you'll, you'll kind of go in the uh, memory lane here and you'll hear some names that uh, you have studied in the back, but we'll take some historical perspective of self. I want to also um, look at some contemporary and historical differences of perspectives of social control and surveillance as it pertains to self. Because one of the themes here, is, here was fear. And I thought about that a little bit. And there's a, actually a great history of fear in Western society. So I, I, I did a little bit of research on that. And there's some really interesting sort of uh, current media and culture references that I will, I will try to bring out just for fun facts to um, tell at the bar later. And finally, I'm going to introduce you to some creative thinkers who put most of this into motion and I think provide the framework for the way a lot of startups are, are thinking these days. Uh, or maybe not. I don't know. But maybe it'll just be entertaining because it is a brave new world and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So did you get, some of you got your hand out? You'll see on the first page there's a, uh, a uh, drawing of three of the giants of the world of uh, human development and psychology. And the first one is Carl Jung. And Carl Jung, the guy on the left, uh, had some, had some uh, principles in his thinking about what, how humans are formed and how we, how we deal with experience and how we think about the world. And um, his thing was that we, we have archetypes within us. We have different kinds of personalities. And I actually agree with that because, I, as I say to my students, are you the same person when you're sitting down having Thanksgiving dinner with your grandma as you are when you're out on the soccer field competing? And all of them, of course, say no. And, and so most of you contain lots of different archetypes within your personality. Um, and one of the things, the other thing that, that Jung said is that you've got to figure out some balance between these archetypes to achieve self-actualization. So um, somewhere along the line, you've got to govern and edit all of those archetypes and be in control of them. So remember that point as we get on to the, um, to the modern and postmodern experience. The second guy was Eric Erickson. And Eric um, thought that you went through many stages of development in your life. And he's the guy who was famous for um, asking, the, asking the question that we all pose to ourselves all the time, who am I and how do I fit in? And that's a question everybody asks all the time. But it was his feeling that you achieved that state of self-actualization through dynamic tension. So you were always in, in, in uh, tension with these different stages that you had to go through. But eventually, you got them all settled down and you self-actualize. And then there was Jean Piaget. And this guy is interesting because he'll tie into the next phase of this sort of the postmodern theory that I'm going to tell you. But what Jean said was, um, you develop your 
sense of reality through objects. You learn about things through um, your relationship with objects. And I think he's the guy who was the one who did the famous experiment of the babies crawling off the edge of the, <laughs> the cliff. You know, they, they knew that there was a space there. And it was that notion of playing with objects and sort of bumping into things in reality that you began to understand the notions of right, what's wrong, what's valid, what's invalid, and, and those types of things. And um, all of that schema, all of that blueprint that you have in your brain is being constantly modified by experience. So we've got sort of the three heavy hitters there, Jung, Erickson, and Piaget. And um, along comes Sherry Turkle. I was talking to a couple earlier whose son is, uh, went to school at and is working at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, it's a brilliant place and with a lot of brilliant people. What they did many years ago is they embedded Sherry. She is a sociologist by trade. She's not a technology or an engineer person, but um, what she's able to do is observe the natives in their native culture. And um, what, she, what her task was is to look at what are these students doing? Why are they spending so much time on computers? Why are they so inured with virtual existence and virtual life? What was it about this digital space that really became interesting to them? So she had a couple of, um, she's got some great books and I highly recommend you take a look at them, but here's some quotes from her. Um, one of them is, virtual life as a digital native in digital space is inherently different, a fragmentation of identity, a multiplicity of selves, and heterogeneous. So um, much like Jung and Erickson and Piaget were saying is when you enter a digital space, you actually experience that multiplicity of selves. And somehow or other you gotta get it all balanced. And if you spend any time in a virtual space or you know, a multi-player uh, game environment, um, I used to mess around with Second Life a lot. You can, you can tell there are lots of multiple personalities flying around there. And, and in one of her books, Life on Screen, she said, the virtual world has become a significant social laboratory for experimenting with the construction and reconstruction of self in a postmodern world. So let me explain that a little bit because there's a difference between the modern world and the postmodern world. And we're sort of being dragged into this postmodern world if we're not there already through this portal of digital experience. So if you look at sort of the top of the, um, with the handout on the first page, I have a couple of, I don't know, those are sort of Vegas-like marquees, but one of them is experience. So if you think about experience in the modern world, um, things are very linear, things are, things are very logical, uh, authority is more or less centralized, and the self is unified. But when you go into a postmodern experience, what you find is the experience is not logical or linear, it's hyperlinear, it's very fluid. Um, authority, uh, logic is opaque at best. Uh, authority is decentralized, and self, forget about it, it's polymorphic. You can be whatever, like the old cartoon says, on the internet nobody knows you're a dog. And I like dogs, and there's a dog here with us. You can ask him, he'll tell you. <laughs> and self-experience is, is um, also uh, different in, in the real world and in the digital world. So in the real world, it's kind of regulated and controlled. You know, you really can't, you really can't get away with crime anymore. You know, if you witness that around here, you, you'll see that there are, the authority is, is right on you very quickly. Um, but in the digital world, it's like whatever. Whatever happens, happens. Um, in this world, we're regulated by real time, by calendars, by seasons. In the digital world, you can, uh, you, can jump, you can leap over time and space. Time and space don't matter. In the, the real world, you more or less can monotask. Maybe you can get away with a task and a half, but in, in the digital world, you can hypertask. Um, in the real world, you're stuck in one place, but in the digital space, you can travel to exotic places. And in the real world, it's very age-centric, and in the digital space, it's age-limitless. So thinking about those things, I will have you flip over your page to the next, to the, the obverse, the other side. A lot, um, back in the uh, 17th century, there was a fellow by the name of Jeremy Bentham. Anyone ever heard of Jeremy ben Bentham? So Jeremy Bentham was a sort of a, a social scientist, uh, a, 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 a juror, um, a pretty important guy. He was also an architect. And uh, this was a very rowdy time uh, in, in the, the uh, history of, of the United Kingdom. So he came up with this idea of a prison that would allow you to um, see what everyone's doing from a central uh, point. And it was called the panopticon. And I love that term, the panopticon. It's always seeing, uh, seeing all over the place. And so the idea was that prisoners would behave if they thought they were being watched. They didn't actually have to be watched, but if they thought they were being watched, 
they would pretty much behave. And it's kind of a, a, a profound thought in, in uh, the development of Western society because um, actually they still build prisons like this today. If you travel around any place that has an old prison, you'll see that they're circular in, nat in nature and a guard could stand in one place and observe a lot of different people at the same time. Um, but along comes um, George Orwell, 1984. Big Brother is always watching. And um, this is a theme that has carried on in popular media and culture for a long time. In fact, it was the subject of the famous Super Bowl ad for the Macintosh in 1984. Some of us remember that. Um, and it was really sort of a, uh, a culture-changing ad because it challenged the way big centralized computing was, going, was working and the Macintosh was supposed to be a computer for the rest of us. If um, you think that this is, if you want to test the validity of this idea that people mostly behave if they think they're being watched, just take a walk out on, free, on the Fremont Street experience a, any night and you'll see, you know, honestly, for the most part, everyone's behaving themselves. And uh, there are um, certainly surveillance going on, but uh, people sort of uh, maintain this thin veneer of, 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 uh, so, of civility because they think they're being watched. Well, there are two more pioneers that you need to think about. One is um, uh, Paul Michel Foucault. He is a French philosopher, and um, it was his notion, he said, the surveillance of technology has now been, in, been extended to everyday life. So you didn't have to go to prison or be a criminal to be surveilled. It's happening out, out on the street all the time. And of course, um, Howard Rheingold, who's considered for, uh, by many people to be the, um, sort of one of the premier thinkers of what was going to happen with the internet, and he thought that you know, the internet would uh, colonize our thinking and that we'd become, we'd become be like and our, our thinking would become collaborative and come together. If you want to see some interesting um, culture notes to this notion of fear and surveillance, um, Helvetica the movie, A Clockwork Orange, Lost. Lost, Lost actually dedicated a, uh, an episode. Anyone here a fan of, of Lost? It was the only, it was the only thing, um, series you had to watch and take notes with, but uh, they actually dedicated an episode to Jeremy Bentham. Um, and finally, um, uh, in the last episode of The West Wing, uh, the president actually took uh, Foucault's book off the, the bookshelf as he was leaving his office. So you can see how this notion of um, surveillance and fear permeates our society. But I think it's because we're in a postmodern time, and I appreciate all your attention, and I'll take questions if you have them. All right. Keep it, keep it simple here. First question. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, my question is, you know, it seems like we're spending increasingly more time online. You could arguably say we spend more time online than we do offline. Um, yet online, people seem to have this total, they have a different personality, you yeah. know, there's total anarchy. Yeah. Yeah. People are like mean as hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how, how do we come to this place in our society, in our consciousness, where we tend to be the same person online as we are offline? And how do we, um, uh, how can we kind of engender these rules of etiquette just to be like yeah. decent? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, uh, one of the consolations is uh, this is nothing new. I mean, this has been happening for centuries. If for a long time, people have been acting out on these different multiple personalities and archetypes that they have. Um, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I I think that's a good research question. You and I should collaborate on that. I don't know. Um, and if I knew, I, I think it, it, it would be a very valuable answer, but I, I don't know. So Frank, I'll let you go to the next side the here. Yep. Uh, one, you don't need PowerPoint given your artistic oh, talent. Thank you. It's really beautiful. Well, it was um, a serendipitous thing, right? Yeah, you yeah. Know, I um, but I was curious about a small statement that you made about surveillance that you think that they're behaving because. Um, you know, that they know they're being watched. And my experience is no amount of video is helping us behave well. Well, compared to what it could be, <laughs> compared to what it could be, it actually is, and again, just go out to Fremont Street. I mean, the, these people are, are drinking and partying, and for the most part, they're, they're, it's not bad. But th yes, I mean, there are, there are uh, elements of uh, bad things going on in society and online, too. But one of the things that I want you to think about if you're an entre a young entrepreneur is, um, how are you going to craft and design your digital experience to, to, to meet this kind of perception of reality that you have when you, when you enter digital space? It's very different, so think about it. Um, first, uh, uh, there's a book out there called Transparent Society by David Brin. I have not read that. You have no. not read that yet? Yeah, thank oh, you. Okay. Then. Well, in that case, in that case, I'd recommend reading it, actually. Sure. Uh, it's uh, very much on this, and so it kind of 
uh, I was going to ask your take on it. Uh, uh, part of it, part one of the things he pointed out uh, in reference to this was the uh, restaurant situation, a restaurant, an open restaurant where people are having conversations, and the thing about it was that you would, uh, if if you stared at them, they could stare back, yeah, and the, and that as a limitation or as a uh, the watch, who, who's watching the watchers and watching each other. Interesting, you know, um, I read a quote about, about the downtown project and. They were, they were asking Tony Shea about the latest technology innovation. He said, you know, we have something, uh, we call it downtown. And we think it's uh, where people will come together and sit and talk. You know, that's kind of like a new thing now. So, uh, there you go. Uh, this weird thing where online we sort of think that we might be anonymous and we can act differently because you don't necessarily know who's on the other end, but at the same time, it's actually as tracked as anything possibly True. could be. What do you think, what is your personal take on how much surveillance is actually happening of the average online user? You know, I, I, I don't have any um, statistics or figures on that, but I will tell you one thing about digital natives, and I have spent a lot of time with students prototyping um, games. This is one of the things that I do. Um, they don't mind giving stuff away. They don't mind uh, releasing their privacy and releasing their information. It's sort of the way they do it now, so it's um, an interesting phenomena. It's n nothing that I would do, but it's, for them, it's, it's, it's what they like to do. Hi, yeah, yes, so um, you know, we have this, this new generation that's growing up, and they've been on Facebook since they were five. Mm -hmm. These people who that's kind of their, that's not a new thing for them, that's just part of their socialization. Have you seen, or are, is there any research about how that has affected their socialization outside of the online? Like, as growing up with those in tandem, is that different when they're developing relationships and in those crucial young ages? No, I, I haven't. I, I'm not, I'm not a, a child development psychologist. I have looked at what digital natives prefer in terms of characteristics in um, digital space, so I can talk to you a little bit more about that later on. Cool. Last question. Last question. Hello. So you were talking about how there was, um, there used to be sort of this fear of Big Brother always watching us and getting kind of piggybacking on what he was saying is, you know, now it's so ubiquitous. Um, people are like craving the attention. They always want to be watched. They want to check in wherever they are. They want to be on YouTube. But, so what do you think about this transition and what's caused it? Um, well, you know what, this is, this generation, digital natives are a generation of samplers. I mean, they've had such powerful tools available to them. Um, and to create original content and post it is nothing. But one of the things that I think, um, one of the things that I have found is that they like provenance to the work that they put up there. So whether, some, whether it's someone's social network or um, some creative content that they're um, producing, they like provenance to, back to the self. There's, um, they, like, they like the notion of um, social calibration, I guess I'll call it. So uh, my, my, my click guy, social calibration is kind of a, a, is an idea that um, people like to, it's sort of like a leaderboard concept. They like to know where they stand and they like everyone else to know where they stand. So um, that's one of, the, one of the things that I've observed. Uh, what, oh, what, uh, is, uh, what are you a professor of? Like, what is I, your I am associate professor of computer graphics at Johnson Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island. That sounds awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.